Hello again and welcome to today's sermon. It's very nice to have you along with us. Well, a common belief is that Christianity is essentially moralistic, that it tells us all sorts of things that we should do or not do. And to the watching world, it can make Christianity look uh, unattractive and unrealistic. And you might get that idea when you read the passage that we're going to look at today, which is the opening part of Ephesians chapter 5. But we cannot read the second half of Paul's letter, which talks about various ways in which Christians are called to live, without reading, first of all, the opening three chapters. You see, Christianity does not begin by telling us uh, what we need to do. Rather, it begins with God saying what he has done for us. So chapters one to three uh, tell us all of those people that have trusted in Christ are seated with him in the heavenly realms. It's a spiritual way of saying that in the heavenly reality we have amazing blessings. We belong to God. We have been adopted into his family. We have been forgiven. We are absolutely secure. And therefore uh, we can look forward to being with him in a world where everything is going to be put right. And so uh, chapters 1 to 3 invite us just to, to sit, to rest in that knowledge. And so first and foremost, we are to sit and with the help of the Holy Spirit to enjoy those realities and to understand more and more all that God has done for us. We are to sit and only then do we come to the second half of uh, Ephesians and to chapter 4 and verse 1, where Paul says, As a prisoner for the Lord, then I urge you to live a life that is worthy of the calling that you have received. Now, this word live here is the word for walk, which is brought out in the English Standard Version, which says, I therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner that is worthy of the calling to which you have been called. And this word walk occurs over and over again in this section of Paul's letter. So if we were to drop down to verse 17, it says, now this I say and testify in the Lord that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do in the futility of their minds. So there needs to be a change of walk. And this language of walking continues into the next chapter, into Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 2, where it says, and walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. It comes in verse 8. For at one time you were in darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. And then in verse 15 where it says, look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise. So let's take some time to think about this idea of Christian walking. It's a fairly undramatic way of describing the Christian life, isn't it? Sometimes the Bible describes living as a Christian as a fight. Other times it's like a race. But this language reminds us that it is also a dogged discipline of day by day walking in a particular direction, something that we do step by step. Not very spectacular, but 
the passage is asking us uh, which way are we going to walk through life? Well, there are three things that I'd like us to notice from this passage. And the first is that we are to walk in holiness. In verse 1, it says, Follow God's example, therefore, as dearly loved children, and live a life or walk a life of love, just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. So the Christian walk is to follow Christ's example of self-sacrificial giving. There, there is no greater love than that. To give up our lives, not just for our friends, but also for our enemies, for those who have turned against us. After all, that's what Jesus did. And that's to be our way of living. It's the way that we are to walk, to follow his example of self-sacrificial love. And the opposite in verse 3, Paul says, but among you there must not be even a hint of sexual immorality or of any kind of impurity or of greed. And the reason is because this is not the self-sacrificial giving of Jesus. It's self-gratification. So when the Bible says not a hint of sexual immorality or impurity, it's not because God is prudish. It's not that the Bible is anti-sex. In fact, all of the negatives in this area flow from its positives. Now we can sum up what the Bible says about sex positively in four very simple phrases. Uh, the first is that God is for sex. It is his idea. He made us male and female as sexual beings. The very first command in the Bible is to be fruitful and multiply. In other words, to have sex. It's very difficult to multiply without sex unless you're an amoeba. So God is for sex. But then second, sex is for marriage. Right at the beginning we're told that a man will leave his mother and father and be united to his wife and the two will become one flesh. In God's design, sex is not simply uh, recreational for me and my pleasure, but it is profoundly relational. It is designed to be the glue uh, which binds a couple together in a one flesh union. It is the body language of a lifelong commitment. If you were to shake someone's hand, you're expressing friendship. If you were to kiss someone on the cheek, then you are expressing affection. But if you have sex with someone, then in God's design, you are saying, I love you and I'm absolutely committed to you. And I think increasingly we're recognising the significance of sex. In the so-called uh, sexual revolution of the 1960s, uh, the language was all about free love. All of those old taboos should be removed. So go for it, as long as there is consent. Free love. But increasingly people have realised, well, it isn't free. There's a cost attached. This is not just a bodily sensation like eating a meal. It is deeply interpersonal in God's design and therefore it is powerful and it should not be misused. Which is why sexual relationships when they break up cause so much hurt 
and so much pain. In God's design, it is the bodily expression of a lifelong union. So God is for sex, sex is for marriage, and then thirdly, marriage is for life. God has designed that men and women come together in a covenantal union. So when a couple get married, they don't make the promise um, as long as we both shall love, but it's as long as we both shall live. It's covenantal. It's based not on feelings, but on promises. Now, I realise, of course, that there are cases where divorce is inevitable, maybe because of abuse or infidelity. But God's original purpose is that marriage is for life. And then fourthly, life is for Christ. The ultimate purpose is to live for him. And Paul points out from verse 21 onwards that the human marriage is a reflection of the ultimate marriage between Christ and his church which is based upon God's covenantal commitment. It's based upon his promises and made possible because of the self-sacrifice of Jesus, who gave himself up for us so that we could be united to him. It's based upon a very lofty view of sex. And so Paul says in verse 3, But among you there must not be even a hint of sexual immorality or of any kind of impurity or greed because these are improper for God's holy people. See, that's who you are, he says. Those who have come to Jesus, you are God's holy people. You have been set apart to belong to him. That's your identity. Now, there's a lot of talk about identity these days. There are those who say that their identity is in their sex. They are either straight, or they're bi, or they are gay, or they are trans. And if that's your identity, then you must live it out. But the Bible says you are not defined by your sexuality, you are defined by God. And Christians are God's holy people. Our sexual feelings might describe how we are, but they do not define who we are. I am one in Christ. I am a member of God's holy family. And these behaviours, Paul says, are improper for God's holy people. Not even a hint, he says, of sexual immorality. And some may think, well, Paul might have been able to say that in the ancient world, which was very different to the world in which uh, we live today. It might have been possible then, but in today's world, where sex is everywhere, this is utterly unrealistic. Well, if that's what some think, then they don't know very much about the ancient world because sex was everywhere there too. The great uh, temple of Artemis, also known as the Temple of Diana, dominated Ephesus and she was a fertility god. So a normal practice as part of the cult of Diana was the use of prostitutes in the temple, both male and female. Sexual orgies were a part of the worship. That was just normal practice. And yet Paul says not even a hint of this must be seen in God's people. Now what does this mean for us? Well, it's anything that does not fit with God's design for sex within the marriage of a man 
and a woman for life. Now, often people ask within the context of sexual immorality, how far can I go? Which is really the wrong question. Because Paul says here, not even a hint. Sex is a great gift from God, but it mustn't be misused or debased. Now, Paul uh, continues over in verse 4, when he says, uh, Nor should there be obscenity, foolish talk, or coarse joking, which are out of place. You see, he's saying they don't fit with God's holy people. These things are out of place for us. In verse 5, for of this you can be sure, no immoral, impure, or greedy person, such a person is an idolater, they don't have any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Now these are very strong words from Paul, but look, don't misunderstand. He's not saying if we ever miss up in these kinds of areas, that's it, we're done for. No, all of us mess up in all sorts of areas. Our relationship with Jesus is not dependent upon us living a perfect life. Otherwise, there wouldn't be any hope for any of us. We're all sinners in all sorts of ways. Now, this refers to those who are living a persistent lifestyle of sin without any attempt to turn away from it. And Paul says that's inappropriate for us as Christians. This is the type of behaviour that marks those who are not living for God, but are living for something else. And Paul says they are idolaters. That is, they are worshipping something other than God. And maybe it's sex, maybe it's romance, maybe it's their own desires, or, or, or whatever it might be. So, uh, verse 6. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of such things God's wrath comes on those who are disobedient. Now let me say something about uh, God's wrath. Because God's wrath is all about refining. It's all about healing. It's all about correcting to restore. It's like Malachi's refining fire to remove impurities so that the finished article is pure. But there may be other voices that say, well, look, it's only a small thing. It doesn't really matter. God's really only interested in your spirit and, and your body is only a secondary matter. And sadly, uh, some churches say these things don't matter in order to fit in with what the world is saying to fit in with the prevailing culture of the time. But in scripture, sexual immorality is not uh, something that we can just simply agree to differ on. God cares about these things. And therefore, verse 7 says, do not be partners with them. Paul is saying, don't join in that particular lifestyle. Don't join with others who are living for something other than God. We are to be different uh, because we are God's holy people and so we should live accordingly. And here's a passage that tells us how we are to live. It tells us that if we are Christians, uh, why we should live in this way. And it's because we are God's holy people. But how do we do that? Well, there's just one little pointer that comes at the end of verse 4. It says, Nor should there be any obscenity, foolish talk, or coarse joking, which is out of place. But then Paul goes on to say, But rather thanksgiving. Now this takes us right into the heart because 
how we live in this area of life, in fact in every area of life, is not just simply a matter of biology. It's about what is going on in our hearts. You see, a person might well be driven by greed, and that's a word that comes up in verse 3 and again in verse 5. It's a desire for more and to have a greedy focus on what somebody doesn't have, and that can dominate our lives. As opposed to gratitude, which is a delight in what we do have. Now, Russell Brand will be known to many of you, and for many years he was very well known, especially in the gossip columns, for a womanising lifestyle. He spoke recently and rather strikingly about that phase of his life, and as he did so he used the language of idolatry. This is what he said. I was looking for a goddess to save me. When you look for God in romance, you are doomed. Your idol will fail, and you will be too bereft to pick up the pieces. My old way of doing things, which on the surface look like promiscuity and hedonism and obsession, was in fact a romantic, restless belief that a woman could save me. It looked uh, superficially as if I was driven by lust, but actually what I was looking for was for a woman to put me right and to fill a hole in my life, to save me. It's very interesting comments that he makes, isn't it? And of course, that's placing an impossible burden on another human being. And so he was constantly going from one to the next. It was an insatiable sexual greed driven by the desire to find someone who would fill that hole in his life. A hole that only God could fill. And that's what is wrong with idolatry. See, when we're living for anything else other than God to find satisfaction, when actually nothing but God will ultimately satisfy us. And so there will just be a continual lust for more. Now Paul is saying here that the antidote is thanksgiving. It is focusing on what we have rather than what we don't have. And that focus for which we can be full of thanksgiving is what Paul covered in chapters 1 to 3 of this letter to the Ephesians. All of the spiritual blessings of being in Christ. You see, ultimately, sexual desire is not a, a desire for sex. If it was a desire for sex, then having sex would satisfy it, but it doesn't. The desire for sex is the desire for a deep, intimate connection and union. But ultimately, that isn't even it, because when we have that deep, intimate connection and union with another person, then all of our longings would be satisfied. But they're not. Ultimately, the desire for sex points to a desire for intimacy with another person, which in turn points us to our longing for intimacy with and to be joined in union to God. We are made for relationship with him. And those of us who belong to Christ have come in to that relationship with him. Just think of uh, Paul's prayers in chapters 1 and 3 of this letter. Paul is praying that by the Holy Spirit these truths can come deeply into our hearts that we may grow in knowledge of and in love with him. For instance, if we have a look over in Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 17, 
Paul here says, I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. And the more we grow in knowledge and love together of the Lord Jesus Christ, the more thankful we'll be and the more able we will be to resist any type of temptation, including sexual temptation. If we're feeling lonely or insecure, the ultimate answer is not looking to another person, it is looking to Jesus. We have a relationship with Jesus that is not just for this life, but it is forever. So walk in holiness with gratitude and not greed. You see, that is the logic of Paul's argument here. Now, our second main heading is that we are to walk in the light. Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 8 says, For you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Live as children of light, or walk as children of light. You see, a dramatic change has taken place as we come to Christ. The Bible says in him is light and there is no darkness at all. And because God is absolutely pure, we deserve to have no relationship with him because we were walking in darkness. But amazingly, the Bible tells the story of God coming down to this earth in the person of his son and receiving upon himself the darkness that we deserve. You'll remember that darkness covered the whole of the land when Jesus died and he faced that darkness for us. And the moment we trust in him, we can be flooded with light through our relationship with Christ. You are light in the Lord, Paul says. Verse 9, for the fruit of of that light consists in all goodness, righteousness and truth. And what does that look like in practice? Well, verse 10, and find out what pleases the Lord. You know, when you start going out with someone for the first time, uh, you want to uh, know what pleases the person. And so, for example, when their birthday comes round, you don't want to make a big faux pas and give them something that they hate or dislike. We'd be very wise to find out what it is that the other person likes if we want that relationship to continue. And we as Christians are to get up in the morning and think, Jesus, how can I live today to please you rather than just to please myself? See, this should be the focus of our lives. And that's why we read the Bible, in order to find out what does please the Lord. And negatively, that means have nothing to do with the fruitless deeds of darkness. Not even a hint, Paul says. In verse 11, have nothing to do with the fruitless deeds of darkness, but rather expose them. Now, that doesn't mean that we go around telling people off. It's rather through the way that we live our lives in the light. The light will shine and expose the darkness. Now, that happened in the ancient world where it was considered normal for people to use the temple prostitutes. It was common for a married man to have a mistress or to have a teenage male sexual partner, that was considered a normal part of society. But Christians were to be different and walking in a very different way would show up those practices for what they were. It was entirely normal if you didn't like the child that had just been born to you, maybe they were disabled or maybe the child was female. Well, the practice would be 
to just expose the child. That was the type of language that was used at the time. And what that meant was you just leave the child outside on the street, unprotected, uncared for, unloved, and the child would just simply die. And Christians started to collect these abandoned children and that action of them showing love and bringing them into their own family exposed the darkness of what was happening. And in time it led to change. So avoid, expose, and God willing, the result will be transformation. That's what Paul is talking about here in verse 13. But everything exposed by the light becomes visible and everything that is illuminated becomes a light. Now that's quite a difficult verse to translate but what Paul is getting at is that in time people uh, might notice something and think well, I want to make that kind of change and I want to come into the light. Many people start coming to church because they have a friend who is a Christian and they notice that there is something different about this person, that they're living, that they're walking in a different way and they want to check things out for themselves. Well, here's the message that God has for those people. Wake up, sleep, arise from the dead and Christ will shine on you. They will see that they too can come into the light through a relationship with Jesus. So walk in holiness, walk in the light and then thirdly walk in wisdom. Verse 15, Paul says, be very careful then how you live or how you walk, not as unwise but as wise. Now wisdom in the Bible is not acquiring knowledge so that you can pass an exam, you can get a, a brilliant first class honours degree and yet still have no wisdom. Biblical wisdom, you see, is walking in the light with the way that the world is all around us. So the fundamental principle is this. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. The fundamental reality of life is that God made the world. And so the key to living a wise life is recognising the reality of God and his plans for the world that he made. So verse 17, therefore do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. Now, because we have a, a Western mindset, which is very individualistic, uh, we can think that this is talking about God's will for me individually. Things like, what, what job should I do? Should I get married? Or who should I marry? And we can obsess about these details, but this is not what God means by the Lord's will. Paul has used this phrase a number of times already in this letter. Just uh, look back to Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 9, where Paul writes, He made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in Christ. And then in verse 11, Paul says, In him we were also chosen having been predestined according to the plan of him who works out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will. God is working out everything in conformity to the purpose of his will, which is ultimately to bring all things together under Christ and in union with him. 
that's his ultimate will. It's God's big picture to put everything right through his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, which has been activated right now through the church. And every time an individual comes and puts their trust in Christ, they become a part of the church, which is just a little trailer pointing toward what will be fulfilled when Christ returns. So wisdom, you see, is recognising who God is and recognising what he is doing in the world by putting everything right through his son and then living and walking accordingly. And so in Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 16, Paul says, making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. The world's in a mess. You don't need me to tell you that. It's broken because people have turned away from God. But Jesus is going to come again so walk in the light of the eternal plan of God making the most of every opportunity is not just saying don't waste your time it's saying live in the light of God's eternal plan now what is it that I can do as the person I am with the gifts that I've been given that can bring glory to God. How can I serve God in the light of his eternal plan? Well, for, for some, it changes the whole uh, direction of their lives. Maybe they give up a career and become a missionary and go off to some far-flung land. For others, it doesn't involve a change of job or location, but it, in it involves a change in mindset and of their focus. Living in the light of God's plan, Paul is saying, don't waste that life. And what does living wisely look like? Well, verse 18, do not get drunk on wine, which only leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit. You know, we talk about being under the influence, don't we? Well, Paul is saying if you're going to be under the influence, make sure that you are under the influence of the Holy Spirit and not alcohol or the sinful world of darkness which is all around us. Now, what Paul is saying here is in the present continuous tense. What he's saying is keep on being filled with the Spirit. It's not a one off experience or it's not something that we just experience a couple of times in our life this is something that must be ongoing within our christian walk and it's linked to those wonderful prayers in chapters one and three where paul is praying that the spirit of wisdom may help us to know god better through the lord jesus christ and the more by the Spirit I understand and grasp these great realities of the opening three chapters of this letter, that I belong to God and that I am in union with Christ, then the more I will live this out in my life. And so uh, what does it mean to uh, live out this spiritual life, to walk in this way? Well, verse 19, speaking to one another, with psalms and hymns and songs from the Spirit, sing and make music from your heart to the Lord. Now, when we do this, when we sing to God, uh, we're not only just singing to him, but we're singing to one another. We are encouraging and spurring each other along on the wonders of what God has done for us and what he continues to do for us. And then verse 20, always giving thanks to God the Father for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so you see Paul comes back to gratitude again, not greed. 
So Christianity is not a moralistic religion because even before we get, began to move in God's direction, Jesus came to work and to live the life that we could never live. He had absolute holiness and purity. He always walked in the light and he was always wise. And then he died the death that we deserved so that we are forgiven and safe in him. And all sins, whatever they are, are forgiven. Even before we take a step in his direction or have done anything in terms of the way that we live, free forgiveness is ours. And so often we, uh, we want to just fish around in our pocket as if we could try and pay for it. Or we say, oh, I'll stop doing X, Y and Z. I'll start going to church or, or I'll start doing whatever it might be. But it's free. It's a gift. And then we find that it's the Holy Spirit who helps us to understand these things so that we actually want to live for the one who gave his life for us. To live a life of gratitude and not greed. Not to earn God's love, but to respond to it. Let's pray together. Our loving Father, please, by your Holy Spirit, help us to understand more and more who Jesus is and what he has done for us, so that from our hearts we will want to live for you, that we want to live a life of thankfulness to you. And as a result, may our lives shine out of the darkness of this world, so that others will want to be drawn to Jesus too. And we pray this in his name and for his glory. Amen. Well, thank you so much for being with us uh, for today's sermon. I wish you God's blessings and grace and mercy and peace for the coming week. Thank you.